Good evening. I'm Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS Conversations with Selwyn. Thank you for joining us. And those of you who are joining us for the first time, a very special thank you. CWS is about having conversations with people about their journey. How are they using their gifts and talents to help others? How are they making a positive contribution to humanity? So I'm always looking for people who have done extraordinary things who are doing extraordinary things or have done things extraordinarily well because I believe that when we share our stories we are never more connected and in sharing those stories we not well I'm hoping that when we share those stories not just to glorify our successes but to share our challenges and how we overcame some of them how, how, how often we got up when we fell so that we can serve as a beacon to others, to remind them that they too can. To remind them that if they commit, if they try, if they are determined, they, they too can be successful. I want to take a moment to just speak about Brazil's defeat today because I think it's appropriate here. And one of my comments is that superiority is not a birthright. That it is very important that you practice, that you are determined, that you are passionate, that you are committed to any endeavor. While we quarterback and while we analyze what's going on, we must give Germany its credit and not just seek to see what went wrong in Brazil, but what went right with Germany. And so when we look back in history and we make comments, uh, especially revisionists, we must not only look for flaws, we must look for what went well. And as such, I have endeavored to try to capture the journeys of some of our luminaries in the Caribbean, but especially Guyanese, because I believe that one day, future generation should be able to look upon some of these archives and get, a better on, get an understanding of what happened, why certain things happened, why certain decisions were made. Tonight... There's a very important and special guest, Mr. Elvin McDavid, who I would classify as one of our elders and one of our leaders. But I want to make a point before we get started that Mr. McDavid is one of our oldest, older, uh, we call him elder statesman, but he's ailing. And so I would ask our audience to be as you normally are, respectful. And whatever question you ask, you be mindful that Mr. McDavid is not as young as he used to be and may take some time in answering some questions or in recalling. So let us be sensitive to that. I usually will read the questions to the guests. So be mindful that if you are vitriolic or disrespectful in any way, I will not read the questions. So I'll take a break, and when I return, I'll return with Elder Statesman Elvin McDavid. Those of you who are joining us for the first time, I'm Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS Conversations with Selwyn. The gentleman next to me is Mr. Elvin McDavid. Mr. McDavid, good evening, sir. I hold on a second. I'm not. Could you repeat that? I didn't hear you just now. I said good evening. Oh, good evening. Yes. Uh, let me just start with your bio. Mr. McDavid worked with the Guyana government from 
1970 to 1985, during which time, in 1970 to 1971, he was special political assistant of the Prime Minister, 1971 to 72, senior cabinet minister, 1972 to 1978, executive secretary, and 1978 to 1981, ambassador, and 1981 to 1985, government of Guyana office of the president. 1985 to 1986, ambassador to Africa, to Lusaka, uh, Zambia, uh, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe. And then 1988 to 1991, research assistant to the University of West Indies. And um, consultant, consultant at Bateman Trust, 1992 to 1997. Cornell. Associate Chief, Chief Executive Officer, 1992 to 1999, Civil Affairs Officer, 1999 to 2000. Then United Nations Mission, Chief of Staff, 2000 to 2001, Municipal Administrator, Kosovo, 2001 to 2002. Mr. McDavid, I just want to get into it. With your experience and what you know, what you now know, if you were 40 years younger, what do you think you'd be doing as a profession? That's an interesting question. <clears throat> my, my, my parents wanted me to be a civil engineer, but I was always uh, interested in fascinated by politics, so I wanted to study to the full side, which I eventually did in England. Um, My, my work properly study in my training was to serve the app, which I, I I managed to do. I hope I did it using the software. So I trained to serve and if I I did I did successfully. And what was it like for you growing up in Guyana at the age of nine and then as a teenager? What was it like for you growing up in Guyana at the age of nine and then as a teenager? Well, I was, was very active. I um, was active in sports at school and college. And, um, I, I had a good time. I, was, I had a good uh, was active in the, the, um, the, the movement of the PNC, the International Congress. Uh, I'm sure won a government scholarship and I went abroad to study. Then came back and went straight to the government. Seeing that something felt that I had ability to be a servant, I was appointed a cabinet minister in Guyana one year after I returned from England. And I've had successful pools since then. Mm -hmm. So, so outside outside of your parents, who are some of the people you admired as a child? Uh, I admired people like Martin Luther King, Gypsy um, Quayana, who was Sydney King. I had a Admiration to him. But Burnham was a man I had a tremendous amount of time for, respect for. Mm -hmm. um, uh, like Castro, I, I met quite frequently on behalf of Burnham. You know, I, I had a, a reasonable exposure. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. What did you What did you enjoy and miss most about your childhood in Guyana? I mean, I, I didn't miss anything. <laughs> <laughs> when when I, I was in office, I mean, it was it was a, a, a very hectic experience. I mean, you in, at, at your house, you had a what was called a red phone. Mm -hmm. I could directly to the Prime Minister, 
It was direct connection, so when it rang, it was only one person could get his phone. And um, it's very hectic. Very hectic. Hmm. If if you if you were to eavesdrop, if you were to have eavesdropped your parents telling a stranger about you, what do you believe your mother and then your father would be saying about you? We we're getting some. Hold on a second, Mr. McDavid. We're getting some unusual feedback. Um, if someone is there with the with the show on, they may have to turn it off. All right, let's let's continue. The question is, if you were to have eavesdropped your parents telling a stranger about you, what do you think first your mother would have said and second your, your father would have said about you? Yes. My, my mother was a, a, a strong supporter of, of, of Fort Vernon. And by, by the attention of the, the PNC, my, my mother's family was strong supporters. My father was more conservative, but he supported the, the PNC. Um, and I think they, they, they I'm very grateful they, they got prevent me from getting involved in politics at an early age. At, at school, you know, I was always active as head of school, head of house. You know, I managed to end up in leadership positions. So they encouraged me. I see. And and <laughs> if you were to have these job the late presidents LFS Burnham and Dr. Chetty Jagger telling a stranger about you, how do you believe they would have each described you? Let's start with Dr. Jagger. <laughs> this is the question. I, 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 was, I had a good relationship with him um, because he, con he considered me as quite a few members of the PP to be on the left in the PNC. So there was no ideological, uh, there's there really no ideological difference mm -hmm. myself and, and the leadership of, of the PDP. And, and then I, I was sent to Moscow's ambassador, which made it even, you know. Uh, I had an excellent relationship with Dr. Jagan, and he, he described me as Followed the, 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 the true believers in the PNC. He had doubts about the, the ideological character of the PNC, the whole PNC, but he accepted that some of us, including myself, we were sympathetic and moving in, in his direction. And in terms of Burnham, well, it is said that I was his adopted son. I was extremely close to him, so. It's, it's very difficult to answer. I mean, I, I fortunately or uh, unfortunately was just like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, in terms of conference and the role I played in Vienna. Yeah. You, you have definitely given me a, a good segue into my next question, and that is some might describe you as having had a front row seat to President LFS Burnham one of the most brilliant minds and an astute politician. What was he like as a strategist and visionary? That was an outstanding man. I think that, um, you know, history eventually will tell the true story about him. Um, he was a visionary. Um, he was not guilty of a lot of the things that he was accused of. And we had people in the movement, he did a lot of foolishness. Um, and one of his, I think, weaknesses or our strengths was that he defended his people. He stood by them. So if you did something stupid, you know, you, you won't be decapitated. He will, he will stand by you. Um, 
But he was, he was outstanding, the visionary, and gave us some strong leadership. Mm -hmm. From 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 1970 to 1971, you were special political assistant to the prime minister, and then from 71 to 72, senior cabinet minister. Is that when your career in government began? And and who introduced you to politics? Well, I I, I thought I was introduced to politics as a student in, in, in England. I was a um, chairman of the PNC. In those days, we had a PNC branches in the United Kingdom and the United States. Uh huh. I happened to yes, we had you know party branches. Um, I have to, to be elected chairman of the United uh, Kingdom one. Wow. So I emerged out of university and straight to the politics in Guyana. I went straight from the university to the Prime Minister's office as a special assistant. And then I moved on from, from that post to various other posts. Cabinet minister, you know. Mm -hmm. Mr. McDavid, I, I am curious. I'm, I'm curious because I was of the 70 era. I grew up, I'm one of, I call them the post-independence babies. I was born in 62. I'm curious about elephant, Mr. Bo uh, President Bornham. What was a typical cabinet meeting like? And what were some of his do's and don'ts? A typical cabinet meeting, first of all, it would be business of government. You had an agenda, you had issues to debate and discuss and decide on. So you, you know, the, 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 that dominated the cabinet. And then after those issues were exhausted, there was a discussion on some topic, you know, some issue at the prevalent at the time. Very fruitful discussion. You got a lot of guidance as to policy out of those discussions. He was. He was known for his wit. He was known for his quick mind. And you were this young, young person who just returned from university, and there you are in the office of the prime minister. But can, can you and you spend some time there, spend some time with him? But can you give us a memorable encounter with his wit and some of his his lighter moments? I, I think that the problem is probably very. Misunderstood in Ghana. I mean, people don't know it, but every Friday night, Bottom, you have to find a, a party for Bottom to go to. He relaxed, and, and you know, he wasn't going to hunt women or anything. He was just going to relax and chill out and shake a few shakes, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> smoke a cigar. Uh, he, he was a fascinating character when you got to know him. Um, and you know, at home, we had a direct line with him. Some of us had a direct line, what we call a red phone. Uh -huh. So, when I ran, there was only one person who was on head. And um, if I asked my son, well, a lot of my sons, answer the phone, and um, he told me where I was. So I used to tell him where I was going. And I apologized to Burnham for him answering the phone. And Burnham said, no, let him answer. So he knows where you are. <laughs> um, he's a very interesting and fascinating fellow. When you got to know him. Unfortunately, a lot of negative things came out of him. His, his, um, his rule was dominated by issues like Rodney and being a, did any of you, did any one of his ministers ever, ever really challenged, challenged him or let me phrase it another way. What was challenging him like? <laughs> Well, I mean, that was suicidal. <laughs> Basically, that was suicidal. I mean, you, I, I went into the party from university. You, you, there was a problem with, uh, I don't know, the job. 
Uh, he seems to have people trying to get him to run for leader the party and all of that. And he, 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 Burnham decapitated it. So, you know, he... <laughs> uh, I mean, there were attempts in, at one time, but eventually after that, he had consolidated his power. He was so... It didn't make sense to try to challenge him. M Mr. McDavid, um, it is written and it is, is spoken a lot that President Burnham had a lot of plans, a lot of ideas, and amazing visions. What was it like when he would explain one of his, his visions to you guys? What was that like? Was he very deliberate in how he explained his vision? Yes, for those of us who were close to him, we understood which, which, what direction he was going. And we understood what direction we had to, to guide the, the various forces in Ghana in support of him. Um, I, I, there was a lot of negative propaganda publicly that seemed to the start of really was the, the party was going on. But basically, Bottom knew what was. He wanted to do and we had we had very clear understanding of his direction to go in. Mm -hmm. Was he was he easy to talk to when you had doubts about something that he initiated or something he wants to implement? Was he easy to approach and um, express your concerns to? Oh yes, I mean well, for me I had a a strategic position, I had access to him all the time, so it was easy for me. Mm -hmm. But just speaking the answer to that is yes. Okay. I mean, if you have a problem, I was. The thing is to go to Bottom and say, look, this is my problem. If you had a problem with him doing something which you didn't agree with, he was. His construction was such a loud detail to criticize him. Privately, of course, that was public. Mm -hmm. Make speeches, thank you, but in one to one or two schools, we are accepted to the system and you know, Oh, wow. Change direction. I want to I wanna go to 1972 because it's a memorable year for the country and the region, especially with Carfesta. Two things that come to mind Carfesta and the Guyana National Service two things that you were intimately involved with. In 1972, when you were responsible for the organization and management of the first Caribbean Festival of the Creative Arts, known as Cari Festa, what were some of the challenges you faced and, and how committed was Prime Minister Burnham to its success? Well, that was a good question because um, in fact, my uh, appointment as a minister was primarily to ensure that first took place because the minister before me who was supposed to be dealing with it did too much. Um, but he did nothing. When I went to the ministry to take up duty, I found a, a five pole with one page. I mean, who has such an international big event and there was no planning structure there was zero. So I basically had the task of mobilizing the energies and skills of a whole set of people to make it work. Mm. Which I think we did successfully. Um how mm -hmm. mm -hmm. how 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 was the the, the the government able to convince other nations that this Carfesta and the timing of it were good for the region? That's an interesting question because I, in fact, was sent on a tour of the Caribbean. We focused on the Caribbean. I was sent on a tour of Caribbean countries to speak to the heads of government about it. Uh, they were skeptical. Um, I am not convinced that we got the support that we, we, 
we required or should have got. But it came out because of the massive uh, support that invested to the government of Ghana, Carcass was one, and, and the other, there was one later on. The government of Ghana put everything into that. And so we re pull it off. But we did not get the, the support in the region that we, we should have got. Carfesta was primarily primarily the gathering of artists, dancers, authors, and musicians to exhibit their folkloric and artistic manifestations of the Caribbean and Latin America region. What was what was Carfesta supposed to accomplish, and was it successful in that mission? Well, uh, one of the things that we was would help enhance Caribbean unity, bring the Caribbean countries closer together and, uh, and help in the, 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 the unity that was being developed in the Caribbean the Secretariat. Mm -hmm. So the kind of political objective in that it was, uh, it was supposed to support the unity process, which it did. Uh, the other thing is that it, uh, it it gives an opportunity to bring to the program some manifestations of culture and art for dance, like Obia. You know, Obia is a, is a cultural phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to, to, to be in the back and try to study a lot of other issues. Mm -hmm. you, you were in government at a time when there were some very astute statesmen. And I think of Grantley Adams, I think of Michael Manley, I think think of um, Dr. Eric Williams, Errol Barrow, and so on and so forth. Um, looking back, how would you compare that group then to, from a geopolitical perspective rather, actually. How would you com compare that group then to the group right now? Oh no, there's a lot of difference. At the time, those guys had an interest in, in creating time reality, which mm -hmm. is important. Uh, there are problems in bringing in, in about unity in a fundamental sense, but they were committed, you know, the sectarical secretary, the Carfesta, and all these things were, were done and supported by them in, in an effort to, to bring the Caribbean close together. In the Asbarians and Diaries, that, that sort of. What, 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 what would you say happened? Did we, did we lose the message? Um, or or let, me, let me put this another way. What do you think might have happened with that that message, that initiative to bring the Caribbean together? What do you think are some of the factors that are at play that that caused the disunity that exists today in the Caribbean? The Caribbean is a very very competitive politics. Very competitive. And, mm -hmm. uh, I think they, they looked at what Burma was wanting to, to dominate the Caribbean, which is not the case. He wanted to bring the Caribbean to this close together. And Caribbean gave, gave us that opportunity. It was, it's, it was therefore not, not without secret, but you we know, only we were able to mount a very successful first Caribbean. So it was a campaign work. Like first one. Um, the whole concept behind that was to expose the various cultural problems in the Caribbean to the Caribbean people and first to see what we could do in terms of working of together in unity. So why is that we've lost? I think that's how we have lost that unity. 
for my son's saying name why we love that thing. Well, because first of all, I think that I think that the difference from the from some of the superpowers. The superpowers never wanted to tell the unity to be reality. Mm. Um, because we gather, even when we gather, we're beginning to this is an economic like we had a boxing association, Ibo, which brought together all the boxing division countries. We had you know various units were begin were being formed to gather produ production agencies and because the bigger countries. In the car, especially in the North America, mm -hmm. then like so, there's a lot of sabotage. Among among the Caribbean heads of state, who do you believe President Burnham respected the most, and who among them were his closest friends or allies? Yes. Well, I think he respected a lot of them because they were heads of state. Um, we, Surprised to go to Ed Williams. Is that so? Yeah, and um, Tom and um, not Tom Adams, his father, what's his father's name? Manly Adams, he was close to, and Manly. Of course, Manly was his, his very close friend. Mm -hmm. Both Norman and Michael. Festival City. This was created to accommodate visiting guests. This is during Car Festa. Visiting guests and artists, whose idea was it to build a whole city with local materials, to have its own bank and post office, police station, fire service, and resident doctor? Who, whose idea was that? I mean, it was a remarkable idea, but whose idea was that? It was not our bottom line. No, the thing is that that was the, the plan to build a city was there long before the capital. Half by Festa. It is right that the two were made closer because of the resources that were available at the time could be easily distributed uh, within the kind of Festa, the resources we used to build. Mm -hmm. did, did you? Um, sorry. We had, we had a lot of construction in the kind of Festa, little places, the whole festival city in particular. The, uh, I want to take a short break, but I want to ask you this question before the break. Did you envision that Carifesta would have been so well attended? The first one, uh, well, the first one, yes, but after that, I think the government, the cabinet government seemed to not to enough resources in it to make for success. And everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only those that actually do the will of my Father will enter. And judgment day, many will say to me, Lord. We are back with Elder Statesman, Elvin McDavid. Mr. McDavid, Looking back on Carifesta 72, what would you have done differently, if anything? Well, uh, I think that we, 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 we talk of modern presidential content. That we're trying to decide to hold it. it it will be safe because I don't need some primary to deal with time first. Um, there's a lot of black people work and boards and so by my decisions. But no one has done anything about it. Uh, if I was uh, involved from the beginning, I would like to know had unique person in the villages. Rather than any kind of person, so then you, you bring everything, the best of the, what you had in the villages to the, to the top. 
I see. In, in, in 1970, when, while serving as special political assistant to the Prime Minister, you organized a remigration scheme for Guyanese living overseas, a land settlement program in the hinterland for Caribbean migrants, and the participation of overseas based Guyanese and West Indian students in a national self help project in Guyana. How successful were those programs, and what did you see as the biggest obstacle to remigration at the time? Well, we have full of resources. So we, um, it's very costly activity. Uh, the government had to pay passages and uh, pay for the transport of people's personal belongings. And, and there, there's a heavy cost in the government. So financial resources mm -hmm. was the, the, the main obstacle for that program. Um, if the people were willing to come home, there was no issue about that. But it cost us, and uh, it literally did cost us a lot of money. Success. I see. I, I wanna I wanna go to the chat room for a second. In the chat room, Nicholas McDavid said, "Greetings from Kingston, Jamaica." Halim Majid said, "Nicholas, I am listening." Uh, Nicholas, hey, Uncle Majid. Gary Best said, "Good so far." Patrick said, "Great to have." people with such institutional memories on your show, vital for our young and the future. KMD said, great show so far. So let's continue. I want to keep strolling a bit longer in the 1970s, during which time you established the Guyana National Service, known as GNS. One of its principal objectives, I understand, was to solve the problem of youth unemployment. Can you tell us a bit about your experience with the GNS in those early years? <laughs> That's interesting because there was so much resistance to the GNS in the system that it was, uh, it really, you know, it took a lot of out of myself and those who were with me, like the Ranger and some other, to really get the thing off the ground. There are a lot of resistance to the natural service. They, there were even government ministers objected to the natural service. I remember, I, I say this because it's the record of here. The national service came up for a vote in the cabinet. Unfortunately, or unfortunately, Bonham was over the country. And the thing, the cabinet voted not to establish the national service. Church <laughs> and you know that. But of course, Mother you know, under the constitution, the president was a he was the state. He had decisions or not binding on him. He was the cabinet. So he he, he proceeded he proceeded to establish it. But there was a lot of resistance. Wow. A lot of resistance. I mean I'm telling you. And, and, and what kept you going? Well, I, I like the idea. In, in 2000, in the National Service, I had gone, Bonham sent me to Zambia, Tanzania, um, and then Guinea, a few countries, to see what they were doing with the National Service. And I, I was convinced that it was, it was good and relevant again. So it was that conviction that kept me going. A lot of stuff happened in the National Service. I mean, people took it over and started to spend money buying a lot of goods and services. But, you know, that was the way in the National Service. Talking about Mr. Nag David, what, what was the short and long term vision for the National Service? And, and how did this institution contribute to the development of young people and nation building? Well, the one thing we had in national service is to induce a sense of nationalism 
and to prepare you for working in, in, in the hinterland and to do agriculture. Prepare, prepare you to work in agriculture and to prepare you to work in the hinterland, set up the communities in the hinterland. We, um, we were very interested in the, the Israeli model of the kibbutz, the most small, small self contained settlement. And those were the three things that, that promulgated it forward. I, I am going to attempt a silly question here, but I'm asking this question because there's a younger generation that I believe needs to know. Why was agriculture such a major push? Why was it a natural arc um, of, of the government's policy in Guyana? Yeah, two reasons. One, import substitution. We were trying to substitute The, the imported items with local products. For instance, I remember we used to bring in imported sawfish. That was prohibited, and we started to produce a, that the sawfish industry gathered them to farm. So the idea was to bring about some import substitution and also to expand the economy, which it did. Mm -hmm. Did you did you at any time, any time at all? Had any doubts, and if you did, who to if you did to, to whom would you be able to share some of those doubts, or with whom? So my hope. Your doubts. If you did, you at any time have any doubts about the national service? How not not at the inception, but as it was evolving, did you at any time in your quiet moments had any doubts? So I think it went off work. Um, and I, I, I think that Burnham allowed himself to be to be dissuaded from putting an investment that is required in, in an institution like that. So was, and then they started to, to set up businesses and all sorts of things. They moved, we moved away from the national side in Ghana one time. Who was that we can I think we got eventually got back to some of the original concepts of the national service. What started to look at this thing as I have it to earn its own to tell you we lost the whole point. Mm -hmm. It had to be a state investment. It had to be an investment by the state. Did, did do you believe in, in your time? Or over time, did the state ever recover its investment? Oh yes, for the national. Oh yes. Okay. Oh yes, we um, from we can be a cotton, we 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 do cotton, black eyed peas. In fact, at one time, um, legumes were produced in, in abundance and were shipped to the to the to the society for some. I don't think it it. it, it, it Mm -hmm. it, track, but it was very much in track. It eventually got dismantled in 2000. How, in your opinion, has that the dismantling of the National Service impacted the, the, the youth of Guyana and the, and the nation? It impacted very negatively because we were providing an opportunity for a lot of employees to, to be actively employed in the south field, in the hinterland, or on the east coast, or, or the coastal belt. And all that changed. Once we started to look at the budget and the people in the government, I mean, I'll tell you something. The National Service had substantial opposition even within the cabinet at the time. And no problem to make. To those who are in the capital. In fact, Burma was out of the country in terms of visit. And the captain voted against the national service. Against the subject. Now, of course, under the constitution, the, the prime minister doesn't have to abide by a captain's decision. 
Sen mümkün bir onu öğren. Bir kabinet. Bir tane bir şey. Eski kabinet. Biz de size bir şey var. 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 If you could have, if you could have the late presidents Eliphas Burnham and Dr. Chetty Jagan in a room, what two questions will you ask each of them? <laughs> <laughs> well, as you probably know, I was very much involved in in trying to the unity process that we were trying to we got embarked upon. Um, From the PNC's perspective, we were serious and sincere about bringing the PP into the government. In fact, we had already developed the cabinet force, um, new force. We had structured the government in cooperation, and then government and die. Um, so, I would have asked them if they were committed to unity. Because that is the main problem we have. I'm not going to be in, in a very superficial sense, but the economy, you know, you have to have unity in economic field. Mr. Mark David, hold a second. Some, some, some people just complained that a video is sticking. Let me try to rectify this the best I can. Okay. Mignan, it should be better now. Go ahead, Mr. Bag David. Yes, well, I, I was finished. Um, we... It is rumored that these two leaders wanted to reunite. Is it true? Who and whose idea it, it if it is true, whose idea was it and what did they hope to accomplish from such a reunification? They were united in the beginning when they entered politics. And with two major ethnic blocks competing. You have to have a unity process to ensure that the government was was properly administered and established. I see. Can you tell us something about LFS Bornum that most of us do not know that will surprise us? Well, he, he, to me, he was a fascinating character in the sense that, I mean, you, you saw him, he had various faces. One, you had the, the, the states, one, you had the the party did they will go about the country doing various things, jumping trenches and have to clean trenches and stuff like that. And he was very committed to a unity process in the country between the two years. And that was a lifelong ambition. Mm. We tried and we nearly succeeded, but then he died and all sorts of things happen. What comes to mind? What comes to mind when you hear the words one people, one nation, one destiny? I, you know, it's a, it's a, a phrase that It's very philosophical about a, a time I'm concerned. It's a hope. Um, but basically, it, it, it inspired us to try to bring the groups together. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and, and when you forced, when you forced for that phrase, what did it mean to you then? And now, decades later, does it still have the same meaning? Oh, no, 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 The, the nature of politics was changing in Ghana from when that in the early 70s, 70s, when that phrase was being propagated. The nature of politics was changed. 
Mm-hmm. So now we're in Ghana, we, we're more, you know, we've been through phases in Ghana, as far as I'm concerned. At one time, just when Burnham died, there was, there was an attempt to bring the, the two major parties together. I was involved in that process. You know, and they were reversing me down the first time. In the words of the late Dr. Martin Luther King, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. During apartheid, Guyana under the, pre under the pres uh, President Eliphas Bornham did not remain silent. How would you describe the significance of Guyana's contribution to the liberation movement of the African continent, but especially the fight against apartheid? Ghana's contribution is substantial for a small country with a small economy. First of all, remember we, we had an annual donation to the African Liberation Fund. Uh, we supported African Liberation with all the fora, United Nations and around the world. And something that a lot of people don't know. We sent troops to South Africa. We sent troops to fight with the liberation uh, movement. It's a public operation, but you know about it. Troops can defend force, troops went to join in the, 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 the mission forces to fight the South Africans. In, in, in 1975, Cuban, uh, Cuban planes en route to South Africa to fight for the liberation of Angola and Mozambique were allowed to land and refuel in Guyana. Considering the geopolitical climate at the time, how significant was such a move for a small non-aligned country like Guyana? Very significant. In fact, we received a lot of threats. I mean, I I remember seeing the, the dispatches coming from oh, Abbasabad where governments said we were going to be overthrown and oh, it created a whole for all, <laughs> which was not, we didn't publicize it, but we came under a lot of pressure, but we stuck to our guns. Hmm. I want to read a quote by the late President LFS Bornham. We give because we consider it our duty to give. We give not only because to some of us, the Africans are blood brothers, but also because we were convinced and still are convinced that so long as imperialism wanders, abro wanders abroad in any part of the world, our own hard-won freedom is at stake. Do you remember where you were in 1970? And can you give us a historical perspective and a glimpse of the mood of the country when Mr. Bornham announced at the Non-Aligned Summit in Lusaka, Zambia, that Guyana would make an annual contribution to the fight for the liberation of Southern Africa? Not quite a stir among the Western powers. Uh, because as you know, the West supported their part that they gave at that time. Right. Um, eventually they they, they, they withdrew their support, but that caused a stir. Um, we were consistent. That's one policy that the Burnham was consistent from 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 day one until so that was the British. In fact, I think they were the like, after that. I don't think he's a live event, so I'd have to be it. But he would be pleased that we made a small contribution. In fact, if you go to Africa, the guys there consider us to have been very substantial in our support. Hmm. 85 to 86, you were non resident ambassador to Zambia. I mean, resident ambassador to Zambia, sorry. A non resident ambassador to Tanzania and Zimbabwe. What, what what would you list as the major achievements of the embassy in that year? The embassy had um, primarily the 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 relationship relationship that was uh, developed between those countries was technical, scientific, and cultural cooperation. 
So we run those, those linkages. Um, we tried to have some bilateral trade, but I don't think that was very, very successful. Mm -hmm. um, but the point is, Burnham felt that we have to be in Africa. If we were serious about the original Africa, we have to contribute in some way. Mm -hmm. Because in the liberation of Africa meant the liberation of the, in some measure from the Western economic system. Because laws like economics were not. I want to take a quick break. But before I go, there's a question in the chat room. Mike, Mike asked, could you ask Mr. McDavid, what was the reason for the alleged brain drain during his tenure and why it continues to allegedly happens today? So we'll take a quick break and when you get back, we can answer that. Side in your name and cast out demons in your name, and in your name, how we not work many miracles? But I will reply, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Woo! All right, let us separate. We are back with Elder Statement, Statesman Elvin McDavid. Mr. McDavid, the question before the break was from Mike in the chat room. Could you ask Mr. McDavid? What was the reason for the alleged brain drain during his tenure and why it continues to allegedly happen today? Well, first of all, there is an international phenomenon of, of very skilled personnel from developing to rural countries migrated to the third, to the first world in 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 supposedly the search of better opportunity. Now the the reason for the drain is is, is uh, my time was, was was many. For instance we had prohibited the importation of, of certain items. And you'll be surprised that the wines Put a lot of pressure on senior public servants. You have to go away and then so the red flowers and other things that were prohibited in the animal. So the, the grain was not exclusively an economic factor. In the sense they were looking for better opportunities, but it was because of of family pressure to to get to fix that because we weren't Important to gather in, in pursuit of our, of our, of our exchange um, saving situation. Um, Halim Majid said, asked, said, sorry, Nicholas, please remind your dad that Guyana was deemed a frontline state by the African liberation movement. Mr. McDavid, you, you were ambassador to the USSR. The first, actually. What do you believe? Why do you believe you were selected to, the, to, to be the ambassador to the USSR? And what were your feelings when you first learned of this appointment? That's an interesting question. Um, I knew I was going to the USSR. It was not something that was sudden. And the president at the time, wanted to get a good insight into how the state system in East New York operated and in, and in, in countries associated with East New York, like Tanzania and so on. So I was, first of all, to promote my advocate, because we used to sell bauxite and sugar. sugar. A lot of sugar we sold in Germany at the time. Germany. And we bought motor cars, we bought music and heavy equipment. So I was interested to do that. Uh, but also to, to look at the, the, the possibility of 
finally my last word, Chris. I want to go back. I want to go back to your tenure in in Africa. What what surprised you? What surprised you the most about Zambia? Its people and its culture, and and how did Zambia change you? Yeah, what surprised me, and I suppose this is a part of my naivety. I was I was very impressed with the high development in structural development fund because when you read about Africa in, in the Western press, you you hear with mud, mud tongues and all sorts of negative descriptions of, of the of the facilities. But I was very impressed. Means I was highly developed. Um, so I was impressed with the, the structural development. Mm -hmm. That and and then the the economy, you know the the couple, they had a lot of my actual trade to the companies. Did, did, with the responsibilities of an ambassador, how did you balance work with family, friends, and leisure, and, and what did you do for fun? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was talking with the... the, the well, the, the, the point is that First of all, you control your own schedule, which is an advantage in some ways. You don't have anybody telling you what to do or what not to do. You have to control your schedule. Um, <laughs> you're free, you, you have, if you're, when you go to the country, my family, my wife and friends, she made an effort to get involved in, 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 in activities in the Soviet Union. She, she started with the Russian you know, you have to do things to get involved. You can't just sit on the side and I see. You have to become involved. Even in Africa and Tanzania, you have to become involved. Swahili, you know, people, when I went to Africa, I encouraged them to study Swahili. You have to become involved and then you, you, you feel part of it. You feel much better. He let you understand the society. Did, did, did you ever get homesick? And, and what did you miss the most about Guyana when you were functioning as an ambassador? Food. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Oh, I, I was there at home. You miss Guyana, of course. <laughs> you miss home, but you were so busy. So you know, at least I kept myself very busy. So I didn't have very much time to. I see. Do, do you remember where you were on December 25th, 1991, when Gorbachev resigned and, and the remaining 12 constituent republics emerged from the dissolution of the Soviet Union? Did that surprise you or did you see it coming? No, we had an anticipation. And the diplomats, you know, you share information and you share your analysis. I, and we had to report, Ghana had to report every week to the government, and, you know, on the status of the country. And I consistently kept reporting that this thing would happen. Because I saw the signs. Mm -hmm. I want to I wanna go into the chat room for a second. And Gary Bess, Mr. McDavid, do Mr. McDavid, do see the Oliver Tambo Award actually being given to LFS Bornham posthumously, notwithstanding the earlier change step by the change step by South Africa, which he supported. Uh, I, I think he deserves it. I mean <laughs> One sixth pillar of our foreign policy was our support for the liberation of South Africa. I mean, that was a fixed, fixed foreign policy uh, position. And secondly, a lot of people don't know. But we sent troops into South Africa to help fight the liberation struggle. And we trained some, uh, the liberation, liberation fighters in Guyana. So we were very intimately involved. 
have families beside me. He reminds me we used to give them passports to travel around the world. We used to issue them a Ghana passport. So they could travel around with the liberation fighters to travel around the world. We were very involved. Mm -hmm. Gary Best, are you writing your memoirs? If not, do you intend to do any more exclusive interviews or perhaps a sit down audio and video interview as a project? We can perhaps call it political reflections. Nicholas, Gary, I can answer that. Me and my siblings have a plan to get him to sit down and write his memoir so that this information is not lost forever. And we are very open to discussing audio and video chronicling with persons. We are actually shopping around, so to speak. Gary Best, great news. If I can help, let me know. Nicholas, Gary, mail me. And Gary Best, I have a great passion for the events of the 70s and 80s to be chronicled. So Nicholas, I am happy with your efforts. Sure, I will. Mr. McDavid, what, what did you, what can you tell us about your work as a municipal administrator while working for the United Nations missions in Kosovo? Well, <laughs> Kosovo was divided up into municipalities. And the municipalities were actually the institutional government for the, for the area which it covered. You actually governed. You made, passed laws and you, you took decisions from them. You took a lot of decisions. The, the, minister, the, the principal structure was really was interesting. It was the executive agency of implementing policy in, 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 in Kosovo. So, as a municipal administrator, you dealt with the building of schools, to the building hospitals, and you know, you know everything. Mm -hmm. well, what, what was your proudest moment in Kosovo? Well, I, my, my, my proudest moment was that I found it. The people were very positive towards me coming from Guyana. Um, because Guyana had a very good reputation. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember I went to a place called Blair. That was me in the but And I was fascinated by the fact that a young lady was looking at me, really too got up and was talking, praising Guyana and thanking Guyana for their support of, of, of liberation in Kosovo. Wow. So, what was it? My son who was designing with my me. But I had, for a short period of time, my two youngest sons with me in Kosovo. Um, and they, they had to leave to come back to the States. And they were upset. The they were upset? Was, yeah, they, 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 because apparently I didn't even notice. They used to give the boys a lot of fruits and so on. And <laughs> when they left, they would keep coming at me why I removed them because they used to <laughs> the mix block. In fact, they were very good ambassadors, my two sons, two smart sons. They were always, you know, in, you know. In fact, they had a tractor driver who used to come to them in the morning. A Kosovo, Kosovo, he would carry them on the tractor and all over the place, you know. What was it like meeting? Leonid Brezhnev, former General Secretary of the Communist Party, and, and how how would you compare him to other Soviet leaders? I I, I met him only very briefly. You know, I I met him once. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you will meet him at some receptions and you shake his hand. But basically, I met him once for a brief chat. Uh, but you know, he was. It was very formal, with nothing of substance, you know. Um, there are other Soviet leaders who I debated with much more openly. Mm -hmm. and, and tell us about your experience meeting Fidel Castro. Well, that was fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first time I, I met him, I went as a presidential emissary, and I, had, I got access to him, and we sat and chatted for two hours. Um, he was very positive about Yan. Very positive about Yan. Um, 
and our relationship with Cuba was very strong. It is it's not between, but it is different now. Mm-hmm. That a world chain has changed. You, know? you you were. I, I want to go back to your relationship with the late President Gordon and a lot of the visions you were privy to or exposed to. What particular vision, idea, if it were allowed to manifest, would have tremendously transformed Guyana economically? Well, two things. But I was very interested in the nationality process. And then he wanted hydropower in the air. Mm-hmm. Um, he was really committed to somehow finding the resources to establish a hydropower system. So those are the two, two, two pillars. Unity and the hydropower. And agriculture. I want to ask you a question that has haunted me for so many, for many, many years. And among my, my, my peers, we sometimes argue that the older generation, the older generation um, in government did not actively pursue mentoring younger people and in so, so, in so doing sort of pass the baton and establish some form of continuity. Would you force a agree with that? And, and, and if so, why do you think that was not a, a sort of mandate of the of the party or, or of the government? Well, well, I mean, I, I have an example of someone who would be giving up people, being guided by, by, by superiors. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are a lot of other people like, you know, like me. Um, but so far, it is very competitive. And sometimes you have to look at what phenomenon takes place at the time that you have these processes. So that was, um... Mr. Mark Davis, if, if, if you could go back in time, I'm going to ask you a couple of those time travel questions tonight, so, so pardon me. But if you could go back in time with what you know now, what would you do differently in terms of passing on some of your wisdom and knowledge to a cadre of young people? I have known so working with a lot of young people and passing on that is your knowledge. I um I was never you see you have to be politically secure. I have never politically insecure. It's insecure political opposition trying to you know not pass on and try to monopolize the space. Mm-hmm. I I sort of passed on, I I had I always had a lot of younger people working with me in the party. I called them in the office of the president, and whenever they got a, a, a promotion opportunity, they got it. So I was not insecure in that way. Of course, because of my special relationship with President Bernard, I, I could do that. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts? And then I'm going to slip into the chat room. What are your thoughts about the dissolution of the YSM? Is it really dissolved? What is, they don't call it something else now? I, I don't know. I, I, so you pardon my ignorance on that, but what, I, what I've been hearing is that it hardly exists today. Yeah, that, that's operational, but um, I don't think it, it's dissolved in terms of its constitutional position in the party's structure. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just that the whole nature of the party politics is changing again. Okay, let's let let me go into the chat room because it's it's buzzing and I, I wanna 
get to, to these questions here. Uh, Nicholas McDavid, great. Cheers, Gary. Kojo Paris, so happy to have initiated this. Great work, CWS et al. Engrossing history. Nicholas McDavid, this is all because of you, Kojo, for sure. Salutes. Selwyn Peters, perhaps you can fill in the gaps. Were you aware of a situation where LFSB had the SB removed the ammunition from GDF personnel's weapon prior to an inspection? If yes, why did that occur? Now, let me just say this. Any question concerning that, you're free to answer, not answer, whatever. Just, you know, just, I just want you to know that. But I'm going to, as long as the questions are not vitriolic, I'm going to read them. But it's up to you to answer yes or no. He was never removed ammunition. Sorry? He never removed ammunition. Okay. Because the defense force have to be, in, be ready to, to respond at any time. So it, it made no sense to do that. I see. And Halim Majid, Kojo, I am delighted to see you. Mike, why didn't the hydropower system materialize? Oh, that's a problem. <laughs> we have to get investment. And a partner was misled in terms of where the investment was coming from. Some of the first ministers have told me that we would get the money to establish it from Scandinavian countries. And that turned out not to be true. So it was a matter of where the money was going to come from. We didn't have that money in Guyana. We could, in the treasury system and the revenue system, we could have generated that amount of money. And the, the whole purpose of this coming from the scandal, even if it materialized. Hmm. Selwood Peters asked, what was Mr. Barnum's thought on the WPA's encouraging disaffection within the armed forces? Did he share his thoughts with you on that score? It doesn't appear to try it though. But we neutralized the, the attempts whenever we discovered it. Um, it was not any significant uh, uh, problem for us at the time. And the the core was, was always behind one. Sun. Mm -hmm. Sun. And Selwyn Peters again. Were you privy to cabinet discussions on the Walter Rodney affair? If yes. Would you care to share those thoughts in a book and or at WARS, WARCOI? I was privy to discussions, yes, but I mean, the thing is that we, we as far as I understand the situation, we are not clear who killed Rodney. Mm -hmm. And Gary Bess. Gary Best said, I can answer that, Selwyn. GDF troops never marched with ammunition. Troops marched with weapons and empty magazines. However, escort troops for the marches had security ammunition. Gary Best again, so it is wrong to say that SB removed ammunition from GDF troops on marches. Kojo Paris, always happy to connect with you, Halim. Selwyn Peters and Gary Best, that was the evidence of Captain Gerard. Gerald Gouvaya at the WRCOI, and he seems very passionate and adamant about it. Thanks for clearing that up. Gary Best, as I understand it, congrats to you, Kojo, for setting this up. So, Mr. McDavid, what inspired the formation of the Forbes Burnham Foundation, and what do you hope it will accomplish? <laughs> but as you know, I, I was the one of the main movers behind the establishment. The idea was to try and keep promoting Bottom's ideas, especially his the ideas like cooperatives and self-help. Going back to those those traditional welfare issues that we used to deal with long ago. Um, so that was the idea, the idea to 
to reintroduce them into the society in the villages. Mm -hmm. What did you enjoy most about being ambassador? Except when you were given an instruction to go somewhere outside the country or stuff, you know, attend a conference. I, I enjoy the freedom that you gave me in terms of my great government of Africa. Mr. McDavid, this is a this is a, a, a question I was asked to ask you. Did you did you see any evidence of President Burnham marginalizing any particular ethnic group um, as a matter of, 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 of growth? That's true. I mean, I mean, people, people felt that there was some talk years ago that he was trying to marginalize into that. But that's not true because. The, the, the investment for rights and and, um, and other things like that went straight into was in, in, in low value dominated industries. So we we could marginalize them. They were key strategic in our agriculture. Sugar too. We never attempted to to withdraw investment from the, the sugar industry. So that is something that we can do. But it's not. If you could go back in time, this is my last time travel. If you could go back in time, what would you tell the 15 year old boy? About what? About anything. What would you tell him, yourself, your 15 year olds? If you could go back in time, what would you tell your 15 year old self? Uh, well, at 15, I was always active in. Movements in organization. Um, I would just say that maybe I could have done more. I don't know. Mm -hmm. What are you most thankful for? Oh, I'm very well. I'm, thank, I'm thankful for the relation I have with Mr. Burnham. It was a fantastic relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, it helped me develop intellectually and academically, mm -hmm. you know. I I had a free hand more or less. And I think I was able to do some things in Indiana. A lot of it is that was that important time. And prevent some things from happening. And and when are you most happy? Well I used to be very happy when I in Indiana when I Going to the villages and sit down at a corner shop and there are no big beers that take a shop and sell us and hear the problems, you know. That's when I relax. A history question. Well, this particular one, Guyana celebrated Ghana Day. Um, why was that so important to Prime Minister Barnum at the time? Could you repeat the question, please? Guyana celebrated Ghana Day. Guyana Day? Guyana had celebrated Ghana Day. Ghana? Yes, Ghana. Uh -huh. when, uh, when Ghana gained independence, Guyana celebrated um, Ghana Day. Why was Gu Gu Ghana's independence so significant to, to Guyana? That's a question. First of all, I, I he had a, a personal relationship with Puma, mm -hmm. which the, the London men were students. Oh. Personal relationship, but uh, I think he, <laughs> he used to tell us he used to be Puma's girlfriend. So he, <laughs> it's not, it's... He had a personal relationship with Puma. 
<laughs> you know, coming down now, we are almost at an end of the show. You, you you tell us something so fascinating, but the late LFS boredom and and his extracurricular activities. But anyway, uh, I want to slip back, slip back into the chat room again. M Mike said troops in the USA do not march with ammunition either. Kojo Paris and Gary Bess, we need to to get more more of our figures from the immediate political history to record their thoughts. Mike, it appears that a lot of emphasis was placed on agriculture, but not on infrastructure. Would you agree? We're connected. Sorry? Uh, we're too very connected. Mm -hmm. the, the emphasis on agriculture is not only to plant more, but to set up institutions. The processing institutions. Mm -hmm. So I think the two are more connected. I don't think it's true. And I have to ask you this question. Tell us about your experience with Morris Bishop. Ah. <laughs> well, um, my son is dodging me beside me to tell a story. First of all, we trained Bishop in Guyana. We trained the Bishop of the first set of Paris in Guyana. They were trained in Guyana. Yes. And um, we were right close to him. But then he he made the mistake of trying to of becoming extremely friendly with another regime which have gave us, which antagonized the Americans. And we used to warn him, we would tell him, look, be careful for your hand. Um, you know, that the Americans are looking at you, and eventually the Americans got rid of him. So my son has to remind me to, to say how troops landed in Guyana from Guyana, which is true. Guyana was very active. We were very active in, in Guyana. Mm -hmm. We set in troops. And I was, um, I was in command at the time. Oh, yeah? In the chat room, Gary Best said, I agree, Kojo, I have video of the past chiefs and early key contributors to the development of the GDF. Perhaps we can look at a project to meet this objective. Mr. McDavid, finish this sentence for me. I look forward to Sunday evening stuff. Sunday. What I read? You read? Yes. I would read the daily papers, the Sunday papers, and you know, the magazines and so on. Mr. McDavid, what makes you laugh out loud? Ha <laughs> 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 just trying to You know, I am like, no, you do that. <laughs> something, something very interesting, like what you just said, you know. <laughs> Could could you could you could you tell us could you tell us um, who if you're at liberty to call any names but who among the ministers give the president pause in meetings sometimes M made him really you know pause to think before he answered. Ministers, you, you have people like Kenneth King and Hubert Jack, you know, who are very highly developed in Phillips with the, the translated into politics. You know, they would advise and. Did you? Those the come to mind right away. Did you ever see him backed into a corner? By any by any of his ministers. Not him. <laughs> he is very astute, you know. <laughs> very good at footwork. Oh really? <laughs> oh yeah. Mr. McDavid, thank you so much for staying up and sharing your, your time with us and giving us a glimpse into your history and Guyana's history. Um I must thank Kojo for putting this together and your son 
Nicholas for his due diligence in setting this up and your daughter Alexis as well. Uh, I, I want to thank I want to thank everybody that made this a reality because I think it is very important that we have conversations and we capture the history of Guyana through the lens of the people like you who have made such amazing contribution to the country and to our development. So thank you very much for that. Thank you for having me. You, you are quite welcome. If I if I may just me read a few more things in the chat room. Gary Best said, great show, Selwyn. Great show indeed. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Nicholas McDavid, like Bill Mayer's show, we should continue the online chats after the show. Shows as great as yours, Selwyn, inspire many questions and good discussion. Nicholas McDavid, Selwyn, you are awesome. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Thank you very much. Mr. McDavid, thank you. And Nicholas, that's a brilliant idea. Guys, continue the conversation in the chat room after the show. I have to go. And God bless you. Thank you.